It's my feel good breakfast show. Welcome back. Thank you so much for keeping it locked. We did promise you a focus on the children today. And, of course, it is International Children's Day. It's widely celebrated on the 1st of June every year. And the day aims to promote international togetherness and improve the welfare of children across the globe, which needs to be a focus. And as the coronavirus numbers continue to rise in South Africa, there has been an increase in cases amongst children. And he had to tell us a bit more about COVID-19 in kids. Please welcome pediatrician and allergy specialist, Professor Claudia Gray. In the flesh. In Thank the you very flesh. much. Yeah, great to, <laughs> great great to, to have here. you in the studio. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Alarming as parents, I mean, we've spoken about COVID fatigue and the fact that I think a lot of us have been desensitized to it. Now, suddenly we hear about a rise in cases amongst children specifically and alarm bells go off once again. How dangerous is coronavirus for children? Because it seems like throughout this path, we've been led to believe that it's not that mm. dangerous for kids. Is that the case? So actually, as it stands, that remains the case. Um, yes. But we have to look at two different aspects in children. How infected are they and how affected are they? Okay. Uh, so I think we need to look at both pathways. But in terms of infection and infection rates, which is what your first question is about, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, causing COVID-19 has been a curious virus because it has been an adult uh, dominant uh, virus. And most of our upper respiratory viruses and respiratory viruses traditionally are children's bugs. And often the children then pass it on to their parents or adults. And all of you will know if you've got small kids, that first year that they're in play oh, school, they get did. sick all they the time. They are the carrier monkey. And yeah. then suddenly we get sick all the time. But with the coronavirus, the COVID-19, it has not been the case. So essentially children have not been the face of the pandemic. Um, we ask about whether the latest strains and the latest waves affect children more. The answer is probably no, but we're just looking at, at it as a reflection of the community numbers. So if there's an outbreak in the community at large, then children which form a proportion of the community will also be affected and infected. So yes, children can get coronavirus, and yes, children can transmit the coronavirus, but the repercussions for, for children from a health point of view have been relatively mild so far, and it remains the same. So it actually is a reflection of the numbers in the community rather than the virus having become more uh, attracted to children at this stage. And again, it's the transmission of the virus. When you talk about this curious virus, mm. it's that transmission that's why we have to track and, and have all the data, yeah. That is so scary. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. Are they very similar with what you're seeing in an adult versus the kids? Are there any similarities? Yeah, so we all know that there's this wide spectrum. It's the great pretender, isn't it? Uh, the the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we can get the majority, even of adults, will have mild symptoms, perhaps cold or flu-like symptoms, maybe a bit of a fever, snuffly, a snuffly nose, lots of loss of smell, loss of taste, and then a small proportion will go on to have the chest symptoms, a pneumonitis, and an even smaller proportion, the devastating inflammatory effects and the coagulation which leads to devastating uh, consequences. For children, they are mainly in that first very minor section. So most children have cold-like symptoms. I've seen many with creep-like symptoms. Children tend to have a greater predilection for gastro, so a bit of diarrhea and vomiting. In our teenagers, we often see headaches, loss of smell, loss of taste, and many children, of course, are entirely asymptomatic or have very minor sniffles. So the range is there, but it's mainly on the milder side. So certainly severe consequences can occur, but are incredibly rare. In fact, more rare than with the standard flu virus. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Now, it's good to put it, and I've often used that to match this against flu, yeah. you know, just to, to kind of keep perspective, because I think it's very easy to lose perspective through all of this. All of this being said, we can't lock our child in a room and isolate them for, for two weeks. How do we treat COVID-19 in our children? And what is the testing? Should we be going out to get our children tested, looking at the, the, how low the risk factors are in terms of what can happen to them? What do we do <laughs> as parents? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think your, your question about testing, you know, we've, we've all had COVID tests here, and yeah. they're not nice. I've had several, like as it, you yeah. can imagine, as a practicing a, a doctor. And my children have had several tests because I'm at risk of bringing it home to them. So in terms of testing, I think it's as imperative as for adults because we need to test and trace and isolate an illness as soon as possible. And I think that's where our numbers in South Africa are very underrepresented because often one person in the family has COVID. They isolate for their 10 days. A few other people might have a little snuffle, but they don't get uh, necessarily get tested. So I think our numbers in children could well be underrepresented because they are not all tested. Um, but it is incredibly important if children do have COVID contacts or flu-like symptoms, especially as we hit the third wave, yes, children should get tested, tested as adults should. We need to know. We're going to we continue to know. The, uh, a very important conversation. Nothing to be alarmed about, certainly from a parent's perspective. This is all information that we have been told. We just need to reiterate it and we need to take it on board right now. Um, so we're going to continue with this uh, conversation. We're talking about coronavirus with our children specifically in mind. And we'll continue in a moment. It's my feel good Welcome back with a very special focus on parents and children. We're continuing our health discussion this morning. Pediatrician and allergy specialist, Professor Claudia Gray is still with us and she is ready to answer all of your burning questions on the coronavirus in children. Uh, thank you once again for anyone who sent through any questions and Professor, thank you so much for sticking around. You've been a wonderful resource for us over the last year. So thank you for that. You said something really interesting before the break. Infected versus affected and that really has been at the heart of what we've all experienced here probably our children most have been affected by the the virus how do you see that playing out what does it mean in the lives of our kids yes i think it means plenty so even though it's predominantly but not exclusively a disease with severe medical repercussions in adults our children have be, have had major repercussions in their lives so first of all if you think about education there's been problems there have been uh, you know breaks in education this is their livelihood at yeah. the moment so that's been an issue and remember that schools are not only for learning maths and English and, and Afrikaans and whatever, schools are also there for mentorship. Schools are also there for socializing. Schools are also there for sport. And schools, in some cases, provide the only proper meal of the day exactly. for some children. Yes, so that's one aspect to remember. And perhaps it's increased the rift between the privileged and the underprivileged rather than closed the rift. Um, so in some cases, households have really been affected and there's poverty and malnutrition. The other thing to consider is that we are actually dealing with an epidemic of depression and anxiety in children. And suicide rates across the world in teenagers have increased quite significantly during this COVID pandemic. Child abuse, I don't know if you saw on the news last All night. All abuse has risen, which means All child abuse, abuse ha has risen. So 250 yeah. cases reported in the Western Cape in the first few weeks of the hard lockdown. And that's the tip of the iceberg. And lastly, of course, normal childhood illnesses or regular follow-ups of asthma or diabetes may have been partly neglected during this pandemic as our shift has changed and our lockdown no. rules have been in place. Um, and that includes regular childhood vaccinations. So a lot of progress that has been made worldwide has been regressed a little bit with our regular childhood stuff. So great repercussions for our children who I must say have been absolutely resilient. I look at my children, I look at their peers, they have been amazing. Children wear their masks, they don't complain. So I think they've taken it on board, but we mustn't forget what repercussions this has had for our little kiddies. I think we can learn a lot from them because there are a lot of grown-ups out there not Absolutely. wearing their masks and complaining a lot. <laughs> of course, lots of questions that came through on social media as well for you, Doctor. And uh, a lot around the, the vaccines and the vaccination process. So I'll start with this one from Johnny English saying, what are... <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Could be a stage name. Um, what are the vaccines out there? Okay, Johnny English. <laughs> 007. Um, 
Well, there, there are many different vaccines and there'll be more coming to the market. So the ones we started off in South Africa with the, with the AstraZeneca one, uh, which uh, fell by the wayside because of initial reports of efficacy being slightly reduced with our South African variant, which is now called the beta variant. And then we've had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a vector. It's based on an adenovirus, so it's a virus, and they put genetic material into that of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's what I've been vaccinated with. So that is the once-off dose. It's not too fussy a vaccine, and that's been in South Africa since February, and that's what all our healthcare workers were vaccinated with initially. Um, more, of, more of late, we've had the Pfizer Biotech vaccination, which is actually genetic material of the virus, which is injected and stimulates us to create an immune response to the virus. It's a slightly different mechanism, and that is now in South Africa. And our elderly population has been vaccinated with that for the last two weeks. I'm very happy to tell you that my in-laws and my parents have all been vaccinated. The Pfizer one is slightly different in that it requires two doses a few weeks apart so tracking and keeping on top of that is a slightly more so complicated more logistically yeah. so I think at the moment they're focusing on the urban areas also it's more fussy with temperatures and storage it needs a minus 20 degree storage and a cold chain so that's slightly more fussy but those we've got on board at the moment in South Africa, there are many more vaccines out there. Uh, the Moderna one, for example, the Russian Sputnik one. But at the moment, the, the Johnson & Johnson and the Pfizer are the ones that we've got on the ground. Yeah. And we know that it's also being driven by what we can get, not necessarily what <laughs> you know, is, exactly. is ideal. Exactly. The whole world, yeah. a global village has been gripped by this. Thank you for, yeah. for kind of breaking the model. I know vaccines aren't necessarily your speciality, yeah. um, but where you have really focused on the children and looking at their holistic health and well-being is something that I think we can all take on board. Prof, so good to, to have you in studio. Hopefully. Do you want to know about vaccines in kids or have we run out of time? Because th I'm sure there'll be lots of questions yeah, you on, can that. Touch on that. So Definitely. very, very briefly, the, the initial emphasis of vaccination is on the high risk. So initially the elderly and then those with comorbidities and then essential workers, teachers, etc., going down the age group. So kids are literally last on the list, but that's because medically they've been least affected by COVID, of course, number one. And number two, it's essentially, uh, you know, first of all, we need to test, uh, test safety and efficacy. So we do that in the adult population first before we go to a vulnerable pediatric population. But the Pfizer vaccine, for example, is licensed from the age of 12 in America wow. already. So they are starting to vaccinate their teenagers, which are, of course, quite a high risk group because they don't necessarily stick to all the physical distancing <laughs> and mask wearing <laughs> and are quite a big risk factor for transmission. Yeah, so um, it's coming our way for children, but it's going to be a while. And, and certainly from a South African perspective, but um, it is happening. The wheels are turning, so I think we can take hope from that. And our children aren't in immediate danger, but it doesn't stop us from needing to wear our masks and making sure that we follow protocol and get tested and get our children tested so that we can trace and track. We need that information. Professor, you're a superstar. Thank you and, so and far much. better looking in the in, in reality <laughs> than on Zoom calls. So, You're too um, kind. I'll no, come again. <laughs> uh, really, really good to have you. Hopefully that answered a couple of your burning questions as well.